welcome to the second talk of uh, this evening's session at the 2020 uh, virtual Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Uh, I will be your host for the next hour or so. Uh, I am Dr. Tom Crawford. I'm a mathematician at the University of Oxford, and I also do various things on YouTube uh, with Tom Rocks Maths and Numberphile. It gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor John Kleinberg, who is based at Cornell University in the US. Uh, he obtained his PhD at MIT in 1996 and spent several years as a visiting scientist at IBM. He's been awarded two major prizes, uh, the Nevenlina Prize in 2006 for developing the theory that underlies search engines, collaborative filtering, organizing and extracting information from sources such as the World Wide Web, news streams, and the large data collections that are becoming available in astronomy, bioinformatics, and many other areas. That is quite the list. And also the ACM Prize in Computing in 2008 for his contributions to the science of networks and the World Wide Web. Today, Press Kleinberg will be discussing how to analyze bias in machine learning algorithms. Over to you. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much for that introduction and uh, for the uh, invitation to be here. I'm going to uh, share my screen to put some slides up. Um, you can let me know if that worked. Uh, great. So, yeah, so th thanks again. I, I want to talk about some work I've been doing with uh, a number of colleagues on um, on on problems related to bias and machine learning algorithms. Um, this is joint work actually across a number of disciplines with um, Jens Ludwig, a public policy researcher, Sentil Malanathan, a behavioral economist, uh, Manish Raghavan, uh, my PhD student in computer science, and Cass Sunstein, uh, a professor of law. And in order to sort of set the context for this, I mean, so this, this is obviously a period of time sort of marked by uh, enormous amounts of uncertainty uh, due to the events that we see going on all around us and uncertainty which is in turn causing pain for for a, a number of different communities and i think it's natural in these situations um you know for all of us to think about how do the particular skills or perspectives that i have uh how might they be able to help uh with the current situation and as i thought about that in the context of uh computer science and the computing platforms that we build it's been interesting over the past uh, num num number of years to think about uh, the, w the ways in which these these systems are structured, right? And in some sense, one of the realizations I think in the design of computing platforms over uh, over the past twenty to twenty five years has been the the way in which there's a, a technical dimension to them. There's the the actual systems that we build, the code that we write, the guarantees that we can prove about those systems. Um, and increasing, though, if you think about the World Wide Web, you think about platforms, social media platforms like Facebook, like Twitter, uh, com commerce platforms like Amazon, there's also a social dimension to them, right? There's this sort of second dimension that we can move around. So that if, if you think about the purely technical system, you're often surprised by the ways in which it's embedded in the social world. And conversely, if you reason about the social world, on its own, you could be surprised by the way in which it's constrained by some of these, these technical systems. And so this was something that um, all through the 1990s and early 2000s, um, a theme that was had already been common in commonplace in compu human computer interaction gathered force across the rest of the field, the idea that there are these socio-technical systems. One thing I think that we've been seeing in the past five to 10 years, however, is that as we move as we work in these socio-technical systems, we, we bump into constraints that we don't expect. We, we have consequences that we don't expect. It sort of felt as though there was a, a third dimension in, in pinging on us that, 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 that we sort of hadn't been giving enough weight to. And in a way, what's emerged in a number of areas of computer science uh, over the past, past five to 10 years has been this normative dimension, this notion that in addition to thinking about the social and the technical, we also have to actually think about the consequences, the societal consequences of what, what we're building and whether we're achieving the outcomes that we wanted, right? Are we achieving the desired outcomes? What is the right thing to do with these systems? Because in a sense, the realization is that just because an actor in the space fully understands both the social and the technical, 
doesn't mean they will necessarily use that system for good or necessarily use it for the purposes that we might want as a society. That is a separate question. And so that's something that a, a lot of recent research has begun to be oriented around this, 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 this question of how do we achieve the societal outcomes uh, that, we, that we might collectively want. Now, in order to think about this, 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 this move into the, you know, from the socio-technical into the normative dimension, it's useful to think about some basic examples, right? So this, this for example, is a, uh, a screenshot from uh, a Net Netflix help page in which they are explaining how they make a prediction that for this movie that you've never seen before, that they predict that you're going to award it 4.3 stars, right? They're making a prediction based on your past viewing behavior, uh, the viewing behavior of other people. They convert your rich dev taste into a feature vector. They have an objective function, which is to minimize the discrepancy between their predicted rating and your actual future rating. Uh, and they try to optimize that objective function, right? This is sort of how we picture the machine learning pipeline operating. Uh, we've all experienced recommender systems. What's begun happening is that people have asked the question, if machine learning is very good at making predictions like this, at predicting what you will think of a movie, uh, we could look in what we think of as the offline world at places where other entities are making predictions and ask, can machine learning help in those contexts? So for example, when someone applies for a job, um, they do something similar to this kind of featureization process, albeit on paper, right? They take their past educational and work experience. They turn it into a tabular form like this resume. They submit it to a hiring committee. The hiring committee in turn is trying to optimize some objective function. What the objective function is, is actually not entirely clear because humans are not very good at articulating their objective functions. But end to end, it, it sort of felt like something similar is going on. We're, we're making a prediction about this person from a representation of them. A similar thing goes on when people apply to college, for example, taking your um, early educational experience, turning into some tabular form in the application, and then an, app, uh, an admissions committee attempts to make some sort of a decision or some sort of a, a prediction. But when we moved to these domains, we've arguably moved from a world of low stakes decisions. In the end, it doesn't really matter whether you correctly guess what I would think of this movie, uh, to a world of very high stakes decisions. Right? It's going to matter dramatically to somebody whether they get this job, whether they get into this college that they, that they applied to. And so this is the situation that we find ourselves in now where uh, algorithms, AI, machine learning, uh, statistical prediction is being asked to make uh, decisions in increasingly high stakes settings for things like employment, education, uh, granting of credits, even in criminal justice where uh, algorithmic tools are in, in, in increasingly being used. And yet the pipeline still follows what we might think of as this sort of, uh, at a very high level, this tra traditional machine learning pipeline where we take an individual um, with some, you know, all the complex properties that each of us has as individuals. Um, we turn this into a set of features. It gets passed through some decision-making entity, which several decades ago might've been a human being, now might be a human being assisted by an algorithm in some fully automated settings might just be an algorithm. And it outputs a prediction. It estimates some future behavior is happening with high probability or with low probability. And one concern that comes up here <clears throat> is the risk of bias that comes into this pipe pipeline. The concern that the decisions might be systematically biased against, against certain groups. Um, now, the, the focus here, that I'll eventually get to will be about bias in machine learning algorithms. But we should appreciate that, of course, there's bias in both human and al algorithmic decisions. And they arise for related, but not, not completely identical reasons. So if we're gonna talk about how bias creeps into algorithmic decision-making, uh, we should start by at least briefly talking about bias in human decision-making. Um, what does that look like? So um, all through the 1990s and beginning earlier, there was uh, an active line of research looking at uh, impl implicit uh, bias in the evaluations that people make and on trying to audit the effects of this bias. And so let me show you an example of a, a classic study from the 1990s um, that il illustrates what I mean by uh, implicit bias in, in decision making. So this was uh, by two um, so, social, social scientists, uh, Christine Vanavrost and Agnes Vold, who published this in Nature in 1997. 
what they looked at, so they looked at reviews of European Research Commission grant proposals. And the idea was as part of the evaluation of these proposals to decide if they would get funded, um, the evaluator was supposed to assign a so-called confidence score to the principal investigator, to the person proposing to do the research. And what these two researchers looked at was to say, to what extent does this confidence score reflect some measure of this researcher's impact? Now, how do we measure the impact of a researcher? That's obviously uh, not, not a completely well-defined question. And they tried many, many different things. You know, the total citations to their papers, number of papers in high impact venues, number of papers in sort of top venues, total, num total amount of research output, total amount of past funding. In a sense, no matter how they constructed these numerical measures of impact, they found this uh, robust and un unfortunate uh, conclusion, which was that for a given, for any of these external measures of impact, the average sc confidence score assigned to um, PIs who were women was significantly lower than to PIs who, who were men, right? There was this um, discrepancy that you couldn't make go away if, even for, uh, you know, people who you, you tried to sort of make as, as, as similar as possible by all of these measures. So this is a story that we have unfortunately seen repeated in many, many contexts in, in employment, in allocation of credit, in many, many domains. It's a, it's a feature of the implicit bias that, that, that humans have. Now, algorithms in contrast, when we begin using algorithms for these, there's this initial superficial feeling of optimism because algorithms have no direct incentive to exhibit bias, right? The algorithm is a piece of code. It doesn't really know anything about the world. So there clearly is nothing in it that has incentive to exhibit bias. Despite this, however, there are many sources of potential bias in algorithms when they go to make these same decisions about employment, about admissions, about funding. Um, why might this be? Well, there are several basic reasons for this. One, of course, is that when we take an individual and we convert them to a set of features, some of those feature values might be based on past human decisions. Suppose, for example, we were building an algorithm to make funding decisions on grant proposals, as on the previous slide. Suppose one of the features we used was the past competence scores that uh, these principal investigators had been given by the evaluators. Well, we just saw in the previous slide that those competence scores appeared to re re reflect implicit bias on the part of, of the, the evaluators based on gender. As a result, one of the features in here will actually include that bias. And so the algorithm, which again, has no direct knowledge of the world, no, no particular incentives to engage in bias, is going to be using those features uh, and the, the bias will come in that way. Similarly, on, on the other side, right? Uh, humans in the end are the ones constructing objective functions uh, that the algorithm is trying trying to optimize. And so again, to return to that example on the previous slide, suppose we said, I would like an algorithm to automatically construct competence scores for principal investigators on grant proposals. Um, and I'm going to train it on the competence scores that researchers have been assigned historically uh, over all this time. Well, then the algorithm would simply learn to mimic the biased evaluations that the humans were doing. Uh, so there are many ways in which bias can, can come into the system. Now, I want to show some bit of the kind of mathematical modeling that goes into reasoning about how bias comes in. And so I thought I would, I would pick, you know, in the limited time that we have here, uh, a very simple model that uh, my co-author, Sentil Milanathan and I worked with to try addressing a particular aspect of this, the way in which the complexity or simplicity of a model might interact with the bias that it exhibits based on all of these all, all of these factors. Okay, so the role of model simplicity in fairness. Now, this sort of relates to is issues both in computer science and in 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 the behavioral sciences. On the the computer science side, a question that people have been asking for a number of years now is, what is the relation between the fairness of our dis algorithmic decision rules and their interpretability? Right, that there's a concern. Uh, extremely justifiable concern that uh, the, the algorithmic models we're building are increasingly complex, increasingly hard for humans to interpret. And if we can't interpret what it's doing, that seems to make it difficult to audit it, for example, for bias. Um, I'll come back to that point. On the behavioral sciences side, mean, 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 meanwhile, there's this notion, there's this recurring question, where do stereotypes come from, right? And these sort of 
pernicious stereotypes that might, might, might lead to bias. And there's a notion that when we're in low information environments, when we're forced to make decisions quickly, that's when we're particularly likely to fall back on stereotypes. And we'll, we'll see that point come up in the, in, in the model that we build. So I, I'd like to now talk about the model for the remaining 10 minutes that, 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 we, that we have in this talk, just, just so we can make this discussion a, a bit more concrete. And in particular, uh, through this model, let's try thinking about this tension between fairness and model simplicity. Okay, so for that, I should introduce a sort of stylized scenario with some notation. Let's imagine we have uh, applicants, maybe applicants for college admissions or for a PhD program. Okay, and we, we have, imagine that we're going to have an algorithm try to help us in, in, in ranking applicants. So the applicants are going to be described by uh, features. We'll imagine that each applicant has this uh, vector of uh, features, each of which is a Boolean variable, K Boolean variables. There's a function f, that's the productivity function. And again, everything here is extremely stylized, right? That this is, if, if I know the applicant's full set of features, then I can estimate their productivity, which is how, how well they would do in my PhD program. And I'm going to sort the applicants by this value, and I'm going to admit the top R fraction, right? So I rank and then I admit the top R fraction. Now, I'm concerned about bias against one group relative to another. So I'm going to assume that applicants can belong to either an advantage group A or a disadvantage group D. This produces an extended feature vector, the Boolean variables uh, x1 to xk and the group membership. Now, crucially, the productivity function is independent of the group membership. If I know the full set of features, x1 to xk, I don't care what group someone's in. I already have enough to compute f of x. Nonetheless, there is disadvantage. So why is that? Well, because features that lead to higher amounts of productivity let's imagine are more uh, distributed toward group A uh, rather than group D. In particular, at the bottom of the slide here, it, this is encoded in this likelihood ratio condition. If X is a better feature vector than X prime, because F of X is greater than F of X prime, then the proportion of the population from group A with X relative to group D with X is greater than that same ratio for, for X prime, okay? so. Better feature vectors have more overrepresentation in group A than worse feature vectors. That's the notion of disadvantage, despite the fact that once we actually know the value of the features, um, as on this line here, it doesn't matter actually which group someone comes from. But better feature vectors are more overrepresented in group A. Okay, let me turn this into a concrete example, uh, which has all of these properties, and it'll be sort of small enough that we can actually work these out by hand. Okay, and that looks as follows. So. I'm going to represent all of the available information in this sort of truth table. This is the value of the first variable, this value of the second variable. There are only two variables here. This is the group membership. And so if you have both variables equal to one and you're in group D, then the value of F equals one. And the fraction of po the population with this property is 118. Okay. Um, all right. So now imagine in this example that uh, the true function, this true productivity function, is the conjunction of these two Boolean variables. Again, this is a very simple example. So if x1 equals x2 equals one, then your productivity is one. And if either of them is zero, then it's zero. And let's imagine applicants from group A have each variable set to one with probability two thirds independently. From group D, it's set to one with probability one third independently. Right? So this is setting up a, a very basic case of disadvantage to group D, right? You, you want both of these to be one, you know, and so, if I'm doing, you know, some admissions thing, think of X1 as representing your grades in school and X2 as representing, for example, um, you know, the sort of if, the quality of your past research experience. Okay. So notice that at all, at all small admission rates, admission rates up to 5 18 of the population, um, all the admitted people would have F value equal to one, the best possible. And a one fifth fraction would come from group D, right? Because a is four times as prevalent in this tranche as group D. Okay, now where does simplification come into play? Well, suppose we simplify F by only deciding to use X1, not both features. Why might we do that? Well, it could be, for example, that collecting X2 is expensive, right? X2 is like how well you did in research. That would involve us having to actually delve into your research. X1 is something simple like grades. Um, maybe on a model much larger than this one, it's because of the goal of interpretability or cognitive complexity. We would like a simpler model. Um, it could be, for example, that we would like better out of sample generalization. And so we, we would like through the process of regularization to actually have a, a simpler model that generalizes better. 
for any of these reasons, we might only collect X2. What would happen then? We would go from this truth table on the right and we would collapse it down to this two line truth table, which we only collect X1 uh, and we look at this. Now we call this an F approximator. Now something has changed. Now at all small admission rates, um, I would admit from this top row, right? So I'm just gonna sort of admit row by row as I move down. Um, the average F value is now five ninths, not one, because X2 could be either zero or one. Uh, the fraction coming from group D has gone up. It's now one third, not one fifth, because uh, X1 is equal to one in a one to two proportion between groups D and A. So relative to using the true function F, when I simplify, I have gains in equity, a larger fraction comes from group D, I have a loss in efficiency because the average F value went down. And this is a trade-off that we often see in the research literature when, when we simplify models. Um, all of this is, is, tends to be true more generally with models much more complex than this example. But there are also two potential difficulties that come into play once we choose to simplify. And these are the two, two, two points I want to briefly touch on. Um, the first is uh, that simplification can transform disadvantage into bias. What, what do I mean by that? So again, we've simplified, we have the truth table on the right here. Now, with the original truth table, right, the one that had all eight rows, if you had asked me, you know, I'm telling you X1 and X2, would you also like to know the value of group membership, what group this person belongs to? You would have said, no, I have no interest in that because once I know X1 and X2, I have everything I need to know to compute F perfectly. I don't care what group someone comes from. After we simplify, if I ask you, would you like to know the group membership someone comes from? You would, and your entire goal is to maximize F, right? You, you, you don't have an equity goal. You would say, yes. In fact, that would help me in estimating F because knowing group membership would help fill in a little bit of the missing uh, X2 value that I don't have access to, right? Because there's a correlation between X2 and, and group membership. And so with group membership, I could build this other truth table, which actually is allowing me to uh, get an improvement in the F values, um, but it's at an enormous cost in equity because now I have this first row that's entirely from group A, okay? So the point is that dropping X2 creates, for, for a decision maker who only cares about maximizing F, creates an incentive to use the group membership var variable and in a way that hurts the disadvantaged group, um, right? And so what's interesting is that this pernicious incentive to use group membership is a close reflection of what we see on the behavioral science side uh, where stereotypes arise when we're in a situation of low information or rapid de decision making, right? We're told that stereotypes uh, are particularly sort of likely to arise when we're lacking in information and we fall back on the, on the stereotype. That's exactly what's happening here. Because I'm lacking this variable, um, this suddenly becomes an incentive to use group, group membership. And so while we think of this as a very human activity to fall back on stereotypes, we're discovering here that even an eight line truth table will, will do that if you instruct it to care about F, okay? That's one thing. The second thing that comes up with simplification, the second concern is that simplification isn't even the best trade-off between the efficiency and equity goals. So again, let's go back to the simplified truth table. Um, let's say we're, we're missing X2. Imagine that I said, I'm going to invest the effort to collect the value of X2 for members of group D when it's equal to one, okay? So again, in our example of grades, you know, looking at someone's grades for, for the admissions process or looking at someone's research, um, we do this, right? If we if we say we are lacking in in uh, in people in our pool from Group D, we're going to start an internship program for them. We're going to do research with them, and the ones who do particularly well at research, we're going to you know sort of look particularly closely at in our application pool. What we've done then is create a new truth table, which is better for F because it starts with F equals one, right? It breaks out that cell. It's also better for equity because we're admitting people from Group D who are particularly high quality. And so what's happened is we took our simplified rule and we found a Pareto improvement. We've strictly improved on it in both efficiency and in equity simultaneously. So it says simplification was never, was not the optimal trade-off. So that's in summary, two concerns about simplifying models, right? We start with the full function, which for our example is extremely small. In reality would be much, much more complex. We simplify it potentially by dropping variables. And we're now at this unstable point where in one direction we tip into incentivized bias. And the other direction, we move toward Pareto improvement, simultaneous improvement. And the main result, which I won't be able to state in any uh, any technical detail from our work, is that 
this happens not just in this example, but with any Boolean function uh, that takes real values, right? So we could say for any real valued Boolean function, G is a simplification of F it's a, if it's obtained by partitioning the feature vectors of the cells and using the averages in each cell. And for every such function um, and every simplification of it, one, the, the, there's always another approximator that simultaneously improves in both efficiency and equity, right? There's a Pareto improvement. And secondly, if this approximator does not use group membership, then adding group membership as a variable um, simultaneously increases efficiency and reduces equity, right? So it creates an incentive to use group membership uh, if for someone who wants to maximize efficiency. And it's a pernicious incentive because it reduces equity as in our example. So this is an example of the kinds of things, starting even from just basic examples, playing with them, trying out the kinds of things that you do when you simplify models. You, you, you can discover some of these things and then generalize them to show that they in fact hold in reality for all, all Boolean functions. Um, so I just want to, since we're at the end of time, I just want to wrap up that this particular notion of simplification is one example of the way that we can reason about models. Uh, but there are many, many uh, such opportunities for results, both results that have been proved in past work and, and a lot of open questions here. Um, a lot of work that we can do can, you know, sort of thinking about the notion of simplification more generally. Um, and more broadly, you know, I think this notion of the interaction of disadvantage and bias, which are two, two, two things, both problems in the way that we deploy algorithms that interact in complicated ways. And so I think there's a, a challenge here and an opportunity to think about, you know, the kinds of collaborations that exist at these interfaces between mathematics, computer science, the social sciences, and, and the policy world, and to, to really understand all, all these issues when we can combine all of these perspectives. I'll stop there, and thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Kleinberg. I will, again, I will leave the round of applause. Uh, I'm aware that you're, I'm possibly the only person you can see, but I'm sure all the other attendees uh, are also hopefully applauding. It was a new, very, very interesting um, um, talk. I, I certainly learned a lot, so thank you very much. Uh, we will now be moving on next to a uh, dialogue session, uh, and Professor Kleinberg will be staying with us, but first we just have a very short uh, introduction video, uh, and so we will both be back uh, very shortly after this. Hello again, everybody, uh, and welcome back for that very short break. Um, we just had uh, Professor uh, John Kleinberg uh, giving us a talk, and we will now also be joined by uh, Joshua Bengio. Uh, and this is a part of the program entitled Dialogue, uh, which is the idea being that uh, a couple of laureates, in this case, uh, Professor Bengio and Professor Kleinberg, uh, will have a discussion based around a central uh, theme uh, the theme this, for this particular dialogue will be uh, how to harden algorithms against biases. Uh, and just to give a very brief intro to um, Professor Bengio, so um, he is, of course, also a fellow computer scientist um, and also an ACM Turing Award winner in 2018 uh, for conceptual and engineering breakthroughs that have made deep neural networks a critical component of computing. So no doubt uh, a very interesting discussion, I hope, will follow between, uh, between our two laureates. So um, gentlemen, whenever you're ready, uh, please do take it away. Thanks very much. So I, I guess I'll, uh, I can ask the first question to Joshua. I, I mean, I know, I know that from, you know, the research you, you do, you've, um, you know, in, engaged quite broadly with the way AI in, interacts with some of these uh, societal questions. So what are some of the main issues that you think about as you 
sort of um, think about the deployment of these increasingly powerful AI systems? Yeah, yeah. So, so there are many interesting issues. Um, let me let me maybe maybe put it in a more uh, personal light because um, it's through the experiences that I've had that uh, I've learned um, to try to understand better those issues. Um, so um, uh, regarding bias, one interesting note is uh, my group developed the, the GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks. And at about the same time, one of my grad students or you know, to be grad students was publishing work on um, uh, learning representations using adversarial objectives to be um, uh, insensitive to some uh, uh, variable that we care about, for example, that we can't predict the race or the gender. And, um, and then uh, for a while I thought, oh, this is great. We've found a, a solution to the problem <laughs> of bias. Uh, we can just add these extra um, adversarial, adversarial uh, networks that change the main uh, tasks so that it can't use, say, gender or race. But uh, um, uh, it turned out that, unfortunately, the, although the theory looked very nice and uh, it seems to solve the problem, it doesn't. Uh, first of all, there are many other um, uh, fairness objectives uh, besides being insensitive to, to these uh, sensitive um, variables that have been proposed. And it's not clear which one is appropriate. And then more recently, I realized that really, um, maybe it's none of the above. Maybe it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, you really need to understand in what social context the uh, algorithm is gonna be deployed. In fact, the same predictor, say for uh, face recognition, which is uh, something that a lot of people care about these days in the context of discrimination. Um, depending on what the application is, uh, the issue in terms of negative social impact and bias and discrimination may be very different and the solutions that you need to look at may be very different. And so um, what does it mean for a researcher like myself or a computer scientist who tries to uh, build such systems? It means that unfortunately, we might not be able to solve those uh, bias questions without paying enough attention to uh, the things we're not familiar with, uh, going out of our comfort zone to try to understand a bit um, how society works, how this particular algorithm is gonna be used in the real world. And fortunately, we don't have the right education, the right training for most of us to do a good job there. And we might be missing, um, uh, we might not even know that we're missing information. And so it's really, really important to collaborate with people who know better, who are uh, scholars in, um, in, 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 in ethics, in law, uh, in, in sociology, in economics, in psychology, you know, whatever is required. And often, you know, multiple disciplines are required to really start um, uh, seeing a little bit uh, the answers to the questions, what should we, what should we do um, not just in the abstract to say whether our algorithms are fair or uh, useful for society, but um, um, it, 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 taking into account how society works and how things are going to be deployed. And um, unfortunately, society is not something that you can put in equations. And so it's going to be hard to optimize over. So um, sometimes it's better to do nothing, but, but, but clearly we need to do the effort to investigate and work with colleagues who who know better and, and know the domain and so on. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. Uh, those are all very important. And right, I think the the solution is is certainly not going to be purely technical. And I I agree. I found it extremely useful. You know, in the in the kind of work I've been doing, this to be able to collaborate with you know to find collaborators in you know in the social sciences, in law and policy domains who, who think about ethical aspects. And it is. There's sort of a danger, you know, I think there's a danger that we see of people from the technical side trying to do too, 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 too much here on a problem that, that really requires um, a lot of things. I think it's also important not to do too little in that there are things we, we can contribute. And, um, you know, and that's, that's obviously the balancing act that's, that's very challenging. But yeah, yeah. One, of, it, one of the nice it, things with these collaborations is because 
um, those other scholars or scientists, uh, they have a different way of understanding the world. Um, they come with different intellectual tools. And uh, of course they have something to bring us because we need to understand how our work is gonna be used. But often we also have a different perspective that could really change their ways of their science, their understanding. And that's great. It's, it's very stimulating. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's, you know, the understanding, you know, and I think increasingly in computing, we understand how much our systems are embedded in the world. You know, the, we, we, we sort of like setting up obviously clean abstraction layers to the rest of the world, but we have to understand that the, the world that we're dealing with in the case of bias, for example, is sort of, you know, you know, there are so many different forms of bias that have already sort of, um, torqued and permuted the data before it reaches us that it's, we sort of can't operate in isolation of that. And I think that's true, um, not, not just in bias, but in all, all of the settings where, where we deploy these systems to think about how it's entangled with the world and, and these collaborations. And, and for students, you know, I mean, I think, you know, it's a chance to really, you know, increasingly people who are in technical disciplines, you know, the opportunity to sort of learn some of, you know, the insights that the social sciences and the policy domain have to share, you know, it's a great opportunity. And even if, you know, even if you're sort of beyond that phase, finding collaborators in those spaces that you can work with and learn from. Uh, very yeah, I, I have found it very uh, gratifying to learn more about these human and social aspects. And it has made me a better citizen. I think that, you know, in general, researchers tend to be very focused and that could be very powerful. Uh, that allows us to, you know, move the, 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 board, the boundary of, of science. But um, as um, citizens or as people who care about how our science is gonna be deployed in the world, we have a duty to understand these other aspects of society um, to, to participate and, and do the right things. So I think it's, 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 uh, it can help us to be better people. Uh, it's not just uh, about the engineering aspect. And I find that the current education system in computer science or math or engineering disciplines tends to be um, kind of not paying enough attention to the social sciences and humanities in general uh, in a way that is important to solve those um, you know, discrimination and bias problems, and social impact problems. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's, that seems com completely right. Um, I see there's uh, questions coming in on the chat. There was a, a question about, given a model, is it possible to validate if it is biased or not and how it is biased and who the bias is hurting? And I think, right, this, 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 this auditing question is uh, a very important one. And I would say it's a hard problem. It's, it's, it's really, it's an open question. It's not something where I think there are standard solutions that we can go to, but um, I think one thing that even makes the question, you know, novel in the first place is how different algorithmic decision making is from human decision making. You know, so we, you know, in some sense, you know, we worry about the black box nature of algorithmic decision making, and rightly so. The models get very complicated, um, but from the behavioral science side, there's a long history of uh, appreciating how much of a black box human decision making is. You know that even when we think we understand the reason for our decisions. Uh, those aren't always the the real reasons. And there are some very inventive um, experiments from psychology beginning in the 1970s, for example, uh, where you bring bring people into a lab setting, you ask them to make some decisions, you subtly change the environment in ways they, they, that they can't really perceive. You ask them to make decisions, you ask them why they're making the decisions they're making. You know that you've only changed one thing, but the reasons they give are all over the place. The reasons are, are sort of things they, they arrived at by introspection, and yet, you know, because you change things subtly that that, that isn't the real reason. And, and I think what, 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 what we often find is that, that humans are always happy to give you the illusion of an explanation. They, they can even believe that's the explanation. Like there, there are lots of decisions I make where I'm pretty sure I know the reason, but, but the, the challenge is that we don't actually know that's the reason. And it's very hard, for example, to ask humans counterfactuals. Would you have made the same decision had the world been different this way? Now, what's interesting is with algorithms, you can do many of those things. You, you can say, what was the objective function that, that, that you had? It's explicit. You can say, here's the model. If I change these three variables, would the answer still be the same? You can ask that question. And so 
when we go to sort of address this open question of auditing algorithms for bias, I think we have levers at our disposal that we never had with human beings. And I think that does create some of the opportunity. Um, I'd like to pick up on one of the questions that was asked earlier regarding the gaps uh, in deep learning. I mean, I could, I, I give whole uh, lectures about this, but, but let me say a few things that are relevant to our discussion today. Uh, one of them is, uh, it's really important to understand that the current state of research in deep learning, machine learning, AI is, um, is such that we have machines that are very stupid and they don't, and in particular, they don't understand social questions. They don't understand moral questions even more. Um, uh, so we, we, we can't rely on them to take the morally right or the socially right uh, decisions. That's why it's so important to have humans involved in uh, understanding those aspects. Um, uh, regarding the black box uh, topic you, you raised, it's, it's, everything you said is very true. Um, nonetheless, I think we could make some progress in the, the ability that humans have to rationalize. So it's not always wrong, <laughs> our rationalization. <laughs> Uh, it's it, it's sometimes useful. I mean, uh, as a teacher, you and I know that uh, it's very useful to come up with a simple story that it will help the other person understand something. And so um, this is uh, this is something that is lacking currently in deep learning. And and I think that there's interesting connections between classical AI, you know, symbolic AI, which was all about the explicit. Um, um, uh, verbalizable information, you know, that we can reason with uh, in a communicable way. And uh, the, the, the current brand of AI, which is uh, about essentially what we do in our brain in an unconscious way, right? that, that intuitive way. Uh, and so we need to do both things uh, in, in a way that's integrated. And it's a lot of what my current basic research is really about. That's, yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great point. And I, I do think, the whole question of like the value of explanations and how we construct explanations is a, a really fascinating conceptual open question. And this this gap that you talk about between sort of, you know, at the sort of neural net level and the sort of traditional sim symbolic AI, AI level, right? I think that is mirrored in human behavior where there's a, yeah. a similar gap between our unconscious processing and our conscious verbalization. And it's entirely possible that sort of conceptual insights we th have for how to bridge that gap on the computational side as you, as you said, Mike, Mike, Mike give us insight on the human side also. Um, and I think that, yeah, it, it's absolutely the case that I think we can all learn to become better at sort of delving into the true reasons that, that, we, that, we, that we make decisions and, um, and, and that's gonna be a very important activity. Um, um, I I see may, there's a, um, a, oh, go ahead, Tom. Oh yeah, please. Sorry, I was just, there was, um, there's just a question that's really drawn my attention. Uh, I don't know if you've both been uh, avoiding this one on purpose, perhaps, but I think it, it should certainly spark some interesting um, debate, which is asked, um, is it society-based AI or an AI-based society? And feel free to interpret that question however you wish. Yeah, yeah society-based AI or AI-based society. Yeah, it's a nice way to phrase the question, certainly. Uh, well, clearly we want AI to serve humanity and not vice versa, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I think, yeah, that part I think is clear. And then, you know, the, 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 qu the question is what's the best way to, to get there? We're, we're building these things to, to, you know, sort of arrive at a, arrive at an outcome that society wants. Um, and, and, and well, then, right. I, I'd like to take a tangent on this question. Um, what does society want? Right. That's a really hard problem that people in the social sciences and humanities, of course, and, and philosophers of ethics uh, are thinking about. And, um, you know, many of us may have some conception about what is the common good and all that, but um, I think there is a potential, something we need to pay more attention to in the way that AI is deployed is usually not about the common good, it is about maximizing profit. And, uh, you know, there's a sense and sometimes these two things kind of, you know, are reasonably aligned, but there's also a lot of the issues that are being pointed out about uh, bias discrimination and so arise because there's a mismatch between the uh, interest of a company which wants to sell some gadget um, or have more users or whatever, 
and uh, the social good, uh, the, the, the mental health, the uh, political uh, health of a democracy, and you know, all of these things can be at odds with the interests of particular organizations or individuals that are just maximizing their self-interest. And what happens with AI is that it, it's a very powerful tool. And so it could be used um, uh, to uh, maximize those self-interests and it kind of amplifies the mismatch that there may be between self-interest maximization and, and social good. Yeah. Those are all, yeah, those are all, all great points. And I think, you know, in general, the deployment of technology, you know, digital technology, computing platforms, it, it's tended to proceed along the lines of let's deploy things that are technically feasible, right? So it's, it's been such a struggle to reach different levels of functionality, right? We've, we've had these, you know, sort of grand challenges, um, you know, grand challenges include, you know, real-time speech recognition, which Yoshu, of course, you know, made such huge impacts on. And, you know, and, and as, as we reach these 50 year long milestones that we've set for the field, we, 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 we push them out into the world. And I think that the technical difficulty achieving these milestones has thus far been a constraint on sort of how much these things get out into the world. And we, you know, and, and we've sort of released them, but as we, you know, as our technical proficiency gets better and better, I think, you know, there needs to be some back pressure from the world that says like, Let's think about the things we actually want to have, and you know, not just have technical feasibility be 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 the be the axis along which we organize things, you know, but 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 some broader discussion that you know involves involves a lot more dimensions of society. So you may want to consider the last question. I think about uh, the different types of uh, definitions of fairness and and so on. Yeah. So there's another question in the, in the in the chat here that if say we have a human in the loop monitoring an AI based system, um, what would be a specification of fairness violations that the monitor could could detect? What sort of abstract formalisms can 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 help us with that? Um, and so one of the challenges here um, is that you know it's natural to see these issues of fairness and bias and to say you know there's an end to end system. Uh, representations of individuals come in, come in, decisions come out, um, and uh, and so, what if I try to find a definition of what it means for these decisions to be fair or for these decisions to be unbiased? And there's been some work in in the field, which sort of in broad strokes, and then again in the sort of limited time we have, I, I won't go be able to go into details. That it, in broad strokes proceeds as follows: it it it, it reaches into these debates about fairness and bias, um, formalizes some of the definitions that people are using, right? So one group, you know, one, one person will say, this is a definition of fairness that the algorithm violates. Another group will say, this is a definition of fairness that the algorithm violates. And we, we write these down, we formalize them. And then we actually discover, we prove a theorem that says, in general, it's not possible to simultaneously satisfy all these definitions, right? There are, there are more reasonable definitions of algorithmic fairness um, that are possible to, to simultaneously satisfy the, their intention with each other. And that says that in some fundamental sense, society has to, and again, I, you know, recognizing all of the problems with the phrase, society has to choose, you know, how does society choose? What does it mean for society to choose? But so let me abstract it further. A choice has to be made because there are different definitions, all of them reasonable. And you know, one, you know, one or the other of them is going to have to be, be selected and the other will sometimes, sometimes be violated. And, um, and I think, you know, in the end, it will be domain dependent, right? So the, the, the question, for example, of, you know, what it means for medical diagnoses to satisfy some kind of fairness guarantee, um, you know, we, we might favor some of the definitions where in the employment domain, what it means for hiring decisions to be fair or what it means for the serving of online content to be fair, we might pick different of these mutually contradictory definitions uh, in different of these dom domains. And that's an entirely imaginable outcome that would be sort of sensitive to the particularities of the domains we're working in. And what it means is that the computer scientists or engineers have to be aware of all of those definitions, understand them, and also uh, work with people who understand the, the social aspects to try to find together what is a good abstraction that that's going to work for this problem. Yeah, 
And I think that's, in some sense, it's sort of the ultimate argument that we're going to, we're going to need sort of domain specialists uh, working on this, that it says in some very concrete sense, we can't derive from first principles what it means for an algorithm to exhibit fair behavior or, or un, uh, unbiased behavior because we have this, this array of, of definitions that, that are not all consistent with each other. Um, I've got um, something else that I would like to sort of uh, bring up to you both, if, if you wouldn't mind. Um, yes, please. Which is, <laughs> um, so recently um, in the UK, there was quite an issue um, with the A-level exam results. I don't know if you were, were aware of this, um, published in August. So because of the, the virus, many students didn't actually sit their results and were awarded their results based on um, what was referred to in the news as a mutant algorithm. Um, that awarded these grades and I found it very interesting as an observer to see that the overall a higher percentage of the top grades were awarded than ever before and yet it was a complete shambles and everybody complained and it was a complete disaster and it sort of made me think that it's it's not is this because we we don't yet have any trust in in algorithms and, and AI as as a society yet, like enough to make sort of as you were mentioning in your in your talk earlier about for certain things we're happy to sort of go with it, and then for other perhaps more important decisions we're not. And it just yeah. made me sort of, you know, as I said, it, it seemed to me like a very recent example of of this discussion around bias because yeah. there were various examples of students from particular areas had their grades lowered and students from other areas had their grades raised and it seemed almost arbitrary but of course that was because in previous years that was what the data was telling the the algorithm so i just wondered yeah. if any of you knew anything about this or, or had any comments about that general sort of story and, and thing that happened in the uk well I, I didn't know about that story but one comment i have is that there clearly is not enough understanding of technical questions, you know, around uh, computers, AI, and so on, in the general population, and this is hurting us already. And so, I, I I've been involved in a project which, uh, according to our evaluations, could you know save a lot of lives, but if if it didn't get enough public support, you know, it couldn't fly. And that's true in many political decisions. Uh, so it's not sufficient to be right. It's like, you know, climate change. Um, you also need to convince enough people and it's not easy. And we have a job there as well. Yeah. And yeah, no, I, I mean, I, and again, because I haven't delved into the specifics of this case, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to sort of, um, uh, attempt to say too much there, but I, 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 I do think in general, sort of, you know, sort of one sort of smaller point and one broader point that, that there's the issue of, I, I think there's a sort of dignity aspect to algorithmic evaluation that comes into play, which is we, for sort of decisions that are consequential for us, um, we sort of expect to be treated as individuals. Someone should look at my whole self, evaluate me, and not evaluate some kind of statistical proxy for me, some kind of representational proxy for me. And so to the extent that algorithms are doing that, it feels like there's a kind of loss of dignity in the, of, of, the, of the subject of the decision. More broadly, I think, you know, we could look back at past technologies, you know, we could look at, you know, sort of the early days of chemical engineering, the early, day, you know, sort of, you know, the early days of sort of, we began creating lots of synthetic materials. And the danger there was, there's a lot of, bad work in the early phases, because there's just a lot of, it's just very heterogeneous. There's all different people doing all different things. Our understanding is limited. And so there's, you know, but these are powerful technologies. So dangerous stuff gets deployed, right? You know, dangerous additives show up in your food, dangerous chemicals get used in agriculture. And until we understand it, and until importantly, until we regulate it, you know, a lot of stuff's gonna happen. And so I think part of what's important to remember is we're in that early, this is an early phase of a technology that is very powerful is being wielded by people with very different levels of skill and ability. And there are certainly gonna be some very bad algorithms out there. And I think, you know, until the sort of skill level gets kind of uniformized and some amount of re regulation shows up, it's entirely sensible, if you're a member of the general public, to be wary just as you should have been wary of 
food additives in the early part of the 20th century. Yeah, I think that's a very good uh, good point to to wrap up on. And just as we uh, come to the end of the session, so. Um, again, that just leaves me to say thank you both uh, to Professor Kleinberg and Professor uh, Bengio uh, for joining us and, and sharing your, your wisdom. Thank you to everybody for your questions. Um, and we will, I will be back at least in, in 10 minutes for another uh, panel discussion. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks to our, our, our two panelists uh, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks very much. Bye.